The other world had bound us with chains of slavery. But we too were human beings. And we too desired to dominate, to wield power. But who would let us do that? So we made our own arrangements to find slaves, our very own daughters-in-law. If nobody else, then we could at least enslave them. Young girls, hardly eight or nine or ten years old, were brought home as daughters-in-law. Girls, even younger, were married off, they were children who could not even remember their marriages. A marriage meant chaos, a lot of hustle and bustle, for eight days. People would go to the fields, cut trees, and fetch the trunks for erecting the pandal in front of the house. Once it was covered with the leaves of neem and karanja, the pandal was ready for conducting the marriage. The bride's family was given a bride price of around 15 to 25 rupees. The bride's father had to meet the expenses of the marriage. The bride's family had to go to the groom's place for the event. They had to reach a day earlier than the marriage. They were given a dinner of pit hail and bakri. In the morning they would begin with the haldi ceremony, applying haldi to the bride and groom. A small platform called bohol would be raised with bricks and a blanket of sheep wool spread on top of it. Then squares would be drawn on it and filled with wheat grains. The bride and groom had to sit on this. Five sawasinis with auspicious stars would be the first to apply the haldi. They would then tie paper mandawalas around their heads. Then, Chennai players would start playing and people would be respectfully invited to attend the marriage. The women who came to apply the haldi were given saltless gugria of jawa grains, which they received in their pullavs. This was an important ritual. In fact, the women would themselves bring the jawa. The seven-year-old bride would be dressed up in a nine-yard sari, white with wide red border and a thick blouse. The women would put several things in her pullav, which ended up weighing at least two and a half kilos. The mandawali around her head would also be very heavy, weighing at least half a kilo. On the first day, both the bride and groom were bathed while the shanai played in the background. Then, their parents, aunts and uncles would also undergo a ritual bath. Once they were bathed, the bride and groom were made to sit on the bohol. Two large tubs of haldi mixed with water would be kept ready. The women would come forward to pat handfuls of wet haldi first on the head, followed by the face, and finally, the hands and the feet of the bride and the groom. This ceremony would take one whole day. The group of girls, called caravallis, from both the bride and the groom's side, would carry small purses full of beetle leaves. They would prepare pawn and keep offering them to the bride and the groom. The caravallis too would keep chewing pawn. Once the ceremony was over the bride and groom were taken for a special ritual meal along with the caravallis. The ritual meal comprised of a huge plateful of rice topped with pieces of jaggery. The bride and the groom hardly got to eat the food. The caravallis would finish most of the rice. All the while the shanai would continue playing, providing a melodious background. The haldi ceremony took place the day before the marriage. In the afternoon, around 4 a euro trademark clock, a ritual bath was arranged for the bride and the groom. Two wooden boards would be placed in the courtyard with two huge pots placed on both sides. The pots would contain water that was boiling hot. Four small jugs would be kept on the four sides and a cotton thread would be taken around the jugs five times. The bride and the groom had to sit on the platforms without touching the thread. The bride had to cover her face with a veil. She had to apply oil on the groom's head with both her hands. The groom would rub some oil on his ears using his fingers. Then the bride was made to pour five jugs of water on his head. She had to stand up for this. But the groom would continue to sit when he poured five jugs of water on his bride's head. All this would make the ground quite muddy. Then the bride's brothers would push the groom into the mud and roll him around till he was fully covered with mud. Once the bath was over, the caravallis on the groom's side would pick him up on their shoulders and the bride's caravallis would do the same. The bride and groom were not allowed to walk on their feet for five days. On the day of the marriage, the bride would be given her bridal sari to wear. The little girl would feel like she was drowning in that sari. The groom would be dressed in a thick coarse dhoti and kati jacket, with a huge turban on his head. He would resemble a scarecrow perfectly. By the time the bride and the groom were both ready, preparations for the marriage ceremony would be complete. Two huge cane baskets would be kept facing each other. A stone slab used for grinding condiments would be kept in each basket. The bride and the groom were made to stand on these. Then, a kati towel was held between the couple, and they would not be able to see each other. Their mamas would stand behind them. The bride and the groom wore huge mandawalas, and over those they wore. Huge crowns called bashinga. Their foreheads were covered with kumkum. One could not even catch a glimpse of the bride and the groom as the poor creatures would be literally buried under all this weight. All guests would then be given rice grains that were colored with haldi, as akshata, to shower on the couple at the time of the marriage. A Brahmin priest would be invited to solemnize the marriage. He would stand at a distance for fear of pollution, but he would never make any compromise on his dakshana. That he took away without any fear of pollution. Apart from the dakshana money, he was also required to be given about two kilos of chana dal, one and a half kilos of rice, three kilos of wheat, and a huge plateful of jaggery. This was called the dry grocery. For the marriage feast, chapatis were prepared with cooked chana dal and salt. The cooked dal was distributed among several households for grinding. Children, with their noses running, would surround their mothers when they sat down to grind the dal. They would keep snatching the mixture and devouring it. There would be flies, hordes of them, flying around. Many would fall into the dal. A minimum of ten flies would be crushed during every round of grinding. The ground dal would be rolled out into huge balls. 
The children would eat these all day long. The flies were terrible. One could not eat without at least three of them falling into one's plate. People had to continuously ward them off. On the third day, such tapatis would be prepared once again. The bride and the groom would be made to apply haldi on each other. The bride was then made to wear a heavy brocade sari called shalu, with a design of coconut trees on its pulav. She would be taken away and hidden among boys who had been dressed and decorated like her. The groom had to find his hidden bride among the crowd. This usually posed a problem since he had never seen her before. How was he to recognize her? It was a tough job. The groom had to search for her all over the place. The brothers would hide the bride by surrounding her. This would make the search extremely difficult for the groom. Finally, he would bribe the caravallis with coconuts and catch hold of his wife. He had to carry her on his shoulder up to the ritual bathing platform. Once he put her down, the boys would make him admit that he had lost to them and would take a conblouse piece from him. Once again, the bride was made to sit down for a bath next to the groom. Then two brass plates full of haldi and kumkum would be kept before the couple. Two beetle nuts would be dropped in the plates. First, the groom had to hold a beetle nut tightly with two fingers of his left hand. The bride was supposed to prize the beetle nut out of his grip. This ritual was repeated three times. Then the act was reversed. It was the bride's turn now to hold the beetle nut. The way she held it would be quite different from the groom's. She would lock her fingers, holding the beetle nut tightly in her palm. The groom had to take the beetle nut using only two fingers. He would have to work hard, as it was difficult to prize the nut out of her hand. He would soon come close to tears. The bride's caravallis would shout an encouragement, and she would tighten her hold on it. The entire Maharwada would be present to witness this game. The bride would not give in, though the groom would be prepared to cut off her fingers. Finally, the groom's parents would coax the girl to release the beetle nut. This ritual was repeated for three days. After the ritual bath the girl was given another huge heavy sari with an equally heavy blouse. The buttonless blouse would have to be tied up with knots. The knot would come almost up to her chin. The little bride would be buried under the mandawali and the bashinga, and weighed down by the pala filled with various things. This was called the sada ritual. After the sada, there would be a procession called rukwat. Crescent-shaped purus filled with stuffing made from the canna plant would be tied to a dry branch. A comb and several toys made of wheat flour were also tied to this branch, along with many broken sandals. People dressed up to represent characters from mythology as well as real life would follow this procession with a cane basket filled with small ritual offerings. The Shanai players would lead the procession. Many people dressed as the father and mother of the groom would walk along, their foreheads covered with wet kumkum. For half a day, this procession would go all over Maharwada. Everybody in the Maharwada would dance madly. Finally, it would arrive at the marriage pandal. People from both sides would gather around. The Rukwat basket would be kept between the two groups. Everybody would be eager to see what was inside. Generally, the grooms. Brothers and sisters were given the honor of opening it. Meanwhile, the women of the Bridea Euro trademark S family would start singing naughty songs, which would be parodies of the groom's mother. The songs called her Inabai and his father Ewan, Here comes the Rukwat, come and watch. Our Inabai's got an itch in her crotch. Give her a couch, she Euro trademark S on heat. Our brother is so mad, he says, A Euro you know what, A Euro trademark, get a he buffalo from the Jatra to fuck her, Theta Euro trademark S the only thing that can please her. Get up, Ewan, take off her clothes, show her the house, give her a bath. This song would make the Grima Euro trademark S mother burst into tears. She would shriek and holler with rage. Then the women from the Grima Euro trademark S side would pacify her and retort with another song that would mock the Bridea Euro trademark S mother, also addressed as Inabai. Here comes the Rukwat, covered with sugarcane leaves. When our Inabai gets hot, you know what she needs. Not less than 56 horses. Theta Euro trademark S what she must have, so get them for her for Theta Euro trademark S what she wants. Our E1 runs around to catch hold of the horse, come friends, and watch the farce. Thus Inabai cools off her itch, so the Grima Euro trademark S mother doles out sweets. This would enrage the other side, so much so that a fight would erupt. A Euro how? Dare you invite us to your village and insult us, A Euro trademark they would shriek. Both sides would freely hurl abuses at each other. Tempers ran wild. If the Bridea Euro trademark S side proved to be too dominant, the in-laws would straightway attack the Bridea Euro trademark S mother and pull her hair. Then fierce quarrels would ensue again. Finally, saner people from both sides would prevail and put an end to the fighting, and the Bridea Euro trademark S mother and the Grima Euro trademark S mother would make up with each other. On the fourth day of the marriage rituals, the ceremony of taking off the bridal crowns would be performed. This would always be done in the morning. People from both families would gather for the occasion under the specially built pandal. A brass plate would be placed on the head of the Bridea Euro trademark S mother, and the other women would hold the plate in place. Men would quietly sit on one side. Women, with tears streaming down their eyes, would sing the Zayla song. The song would soon have every person sobbing. The heavy crowns were then taken off. Zalyabai Zalu, in front of the Hausia, AA there was a lovely jujube tree. Then came a thief, the son in law AA he carried it off, for all to see. But the tree was his, Theta Euro trademark s how it is, my poor love, helpless, weeps. Zalyabai Zalu, in front of the house there was a jasmine vine. Weep not, O poor mother of mine. Zalyabai Zalu, in front of the house there was a chimpak white. Weep not, O poor father of mine. 
Zalia by Zalu, a flock of birds have flown away, out of sight. Weep not, O poor brother of mine. Zalia by Zalu, what's left behind is a reflection in the mirror. Weep not, O poor sister of mine. However, for the girl, marriage meant nothing but calamity. After the marriage, she was allowed to stay with her parents for a few days. But then her Sasra would go to fetch her. He would bring with him gram, rice and jaggery. The Bridea Euro trademark's mother would then prepare small sweetmeats with these. The girl would carry the basket filled with these sweets to her new home. Thus the girl would embark upon a new life that was harsh and arduous. She was a young girl, a child really, still immature. Yet, the poor child had to break all ties of love and go to her in-laws a Euro trademark house to lead a married life, without even knowing what a husband meant, or what it was to be given away. Besides, in those days there were no vehicles. When the cock crowed early in the morning, the Sasra would start with his daughter-in-law on foot. It took two to three days to reach his home. Even if the place was close by, they invariably would have to walk for the entire day. When the bride arrived at her in Los Euro trademark home, she would be asked to make bakris. Two baskets full. The child would sit down to make them, but she would not be able to pat the balls of dough into proper round shapes. They would remain thick and small, no bigger than her palms. When she put them on the hot tawa, it would invariably get burnt in some places and remain uncooked in some. Then the Sasu would call all her friends and neighbors and hold an open exhibition of the tiny burnt bakris, a Euro Taibai, come and see what a Euro trademark is happening here. Didn't a Euro trademark to you think that I a Euro trademark D brought the daughter of a good woman into my house? Look at the bakris this slut has prepared. She can a Euro trademark T even make a few bakris properly. Oh well, what can one expect of this daughter of a dunce, a Euro trademark? The child was not even allowed to sleep. When the cock crowed at three in the morning, the Sasu would wake her, dragging her by her hair. She would make her clean the grinding stones and would sit down to grind some jour with her. But almost immediately, the Saju Euro trademark s newborn baby would wake up and start crying. Then the Sasra would yell, A Euro come here, you. This Dondia is crying. Come and stop his wailing. Leave the grinding to her. Otherwise, when will she learn? A Euro trademark. The Sasa would promptly get up from the mill and go back to sleep, nursing her baby. The young girl had to continue with the work. Her tiny hands often could not pull the heavy stones, and she would have to stop frequently. Her palms would get blisters. Later on they would harden. After the grinding was done, she would be sent to the river with a small vessel to fetch water. When that was done, she had to sit down to make bakris. If the bakris were in a Euro trademark tea perfect, her Sasa would examine the kneaded flour and slap the girl on the face with the unbaked bakris, pinch her cheeks, and shower a million abuses on her, a your what a Euro trademark s your AAI really. Tell me. Is she a good married woman at all? Or does she know only how to run after the pot macro Euro trademark s donkeys? Didn't a Euro trademark tea she teach you anything? I pamper you a little and you take advantage of that. Look what a nice Sasu I am. My own Sasu was a spitfire. A burning coal. Holding a burning coal in. Own a Euro trademark s palm was easier than living with her, a Euro trademark. Then she would mourn her fate loudly and go on in a voice drenched in self-pity, a Euro we could not even dare to call a dog or a hen in our in loss a Euro trademark house by any name whatsoever. We had to address these animals respectfully even while we kicked them out. Where would you get a sasu as nice as me? You pampered brat. Lift the plate on your lap and eat. You are like a beast gone mad, eating so. Simply out of control, theta euro trademark s what you are. Theta euro trademark s why you a euro trademark re being such a pest, a euro trademark the sasu would continue to rant. The poor girl had to endure the abuses of everybody in the household, including her haughty sisters-in-law and her lousy brothers-in-law. By the time she finished all the housework, it would be half past one in the afternoon. By then, all the bakris would have been eaten up. All that was left for her would be the half-burnt, half-baked bakris that she herself had made. But what could she eat them with? She would steal some salt from the kitchen when her sasu was not looking and hide it in her sari. The Mahar daughters-in-law experienced one comfort, however. There were no pots in the house to clean and no clothes to wash because there were not even enough rags to wear. When the Sajua Euro trademark s monthly period started, she would go straight to the river to bathe as she had no spare sari. There she would take off half her sari, wrapping herself in the other half. She would wash one half of the sari first. When that portion was dry, she would wrap it around herself and wash the other half. And that half too would be patched up in several places. It would be afternoon by the time she returned home. Till then, the daughter-in-law had to do everything by herself. This rigorous punishment at a young age, however, was far preferable to what she had to endure once she reached maturity. When the daughter-in-law got her menstrual period for the first time, the Sasa would become terribly agitated and keep a close watch on her daughter-in-law and her son. She would watch them with the eyes of a hawk, and would not let them even glance at each other. The husband of the bride would keep hovering around, yearning to talk to his wife. But the Sasa was far too clever for him. She would not let them meet. She stayed awake at night for fear of their coming together. She would be terribly scared that her son would be snatched away from her, and that he would forget his parents, and begin to pamper his wife. Immediately after they went to bed, she would wake her daughter-in-law up to grind the grain. Other women would add fat to the fire, a hey, you are so stupid. How can you allow their coming together? 
Don't a euro trademark to you let her sleep with your son. Beware at the delicate bud will break. Beware of her, a euro trademark the sauce of wood. Believe such malicious talk and poison her son a euro trademark s mind against his wife. She would be worried all the time about his falling in love with his wife. Her daughter-in-law was her enemy. She would feel terribly jealous of her youth. She would constantly keep complaining to her son about his wife. When her daughter-in-law finished grinding the jower, the sasa would send her to fetch water. The sasa would whisper into her Sona Euro trademark s ear, a euro watch her, you fool. Look how she goes out all the time. That Sarangia follows her to the river and whistles at her. Keep her under your thumb. Otherwise you will be disgraced in public. A euro trademark, and while she was away, the sasa would grind some glass bangles and mix the glass powder with the flour. One when the daughter-in-law returned, she would be asked to make bakris with that flour. The sasa would put a piece of the bakri into her mouth and spit it out. Then she would go from house to house with that bakri, a euro just taste this bakri. It feels as if glass is mixed in it. A euro trademark. The neighborhood women simply loved such conspiracies. This provided some excitement to their otherwise uneventful lives. The whole village would gather in front of the tortured girl a euro trademark s door. A euro the witch. Wanted to kill the whole family. Oh, she shouldn't a euro trademark t have attempted to stab her own family in the back. A euro trademark, then the sasu would wail loudly, beating her breasts. She would complain to every passerby, a euro look, master, how this witch tried to do away with my family and the kids as well. A euro trademark. To make things worse, a woman would become possessed. Then she would start chanting, A Eurowa, eat a Euro trademark s because of my blessing that you were saved from this woman. This woman is an evil presence in your house. Don't a Euro trademark t ever trust her. But you too forgot your god. Give your Sona Euro trademark s firstborn to Madmalu. A Euro trademark. This pronouncement chilled the hearts of the women and made them tremble with fear. They would hastily apply kumkum and haldi on the possessed woman a Euro trademark s forehead and fall at her feet. Amidst this chaos, the poor daughter in law would tremble like a leaf. Petrified and unable to utter a single word, she would watch the people around her with a sinking heart. The furious husband would beat her to a pulp with a stick and drive her out of the house. She was an easy prey. Anybody could torture her as they wished. One it was not unusual for glass bangles to break while grinding. If a bangle broke, a woman had to take care to pick all the pieces out. A careful worker kept her bangles intact and mentioned with pride that she kept them from one to Wally. Festival to the next, when the old bangles were replaced with new. 9. 